Hello, I'm so glad you all came out on this warm day. It's very hot, so thank you for that. I guess you're interested in knowing about the pollinators and maybe how you might be able to attract them to your garden. Um, but I'm gonna first start out by telling you what pollination is. Pollination is the transfer of pollen to allow for fertilization. Plants can't move to find a mate, so they have to have help from the environment to transfer genetic material. Uh, millions of years ago, plants developed flowers to attract insects so that they could help move the pollen from the male part of one plant to the female part of another plant. So why do we need pollinators? Well, even if we had good weather, uh, the fruits would not form properly if you did not have any kind of pollination. Over 90 crops in the United States depend on pollinators. And without that pollination, we wouldn't have the huge variety of fruits and vegetables that we currently have. Uh, also, about 80% of all flowering plants require pollinators. So they are very, very important. So who are the pollinators? Well, there are about 200,000 different species that act as pollinators in the world. Now, when you think of pollinators, what's the first pollinator that you think of? Anybody? A bee, the honeybee, you're right. And the reason most people think of the honeybee is because it does the majority of work in pollinating our food crops. Without the honeybee, we probably wouldn't have all the fruits and vegetables that we currently have. Uh, in fact, there are commercial beekeepers that go around to the different parts of the country with their beehives to pollinate the crops. So uh, they, are, they play an important role in our food production. Um, but you know, there are a lot of other pollinators out there. Native bees are a major pollinator. Uh, they do most of the pollinating on our native plants. And in fact, they have been pollinating our plants long before the honeybee ever arrived in the United States. Uh, did you know that in North Carolina alone, there are 500 species of native bees? Quite a few. Uh, now, they come in a wider range of shapes, sizes, and colors. They also vary in the plants that they visit and the season of their activity. Are you aware that bees have tongues? And the length of their tongue actually determines what flowers they can visit uh, and obtain pollen from. And I, I, I failed to tell you when we were talking about the honeybee, the honeybee is the only pollinator that purposely goes out to collect pollen. All of the other pollinators, basically that's just kind of a side job for them. <laughs> they just, as they're, Getting the nectar, they collect that pollen and carry it over to another uh, plant. But there are still a lot of pollinators out there other than the bees. You have butterflies, you have hummingbirds, flies, wasps, even bats can act as pollinators. Uh, so what can we do to help our pollinators? Well, there's quite a few things that we can do. Uh, you can plant flowers that bloom at different times of the year because our pollinators need food all year long. You also can think about planting more native plants. Native plants have more pollen and nectar than the hybrid plants do. So think about natives when you are uh, designing your garden. Also, you might want to diversify some and plant flowers that are going to attract different types of pollinators, not just bees or hummingbirds or uh, butterflies, but various different types of pollinators. And if you do need to use a pesticide, there are some things that you can do to help our pollinators. First, you know how windy it is here on the Outer Banks, so you want to not spray whenever there's a lot of wind out there. Because what's gonna happen is that spray is going to go onto other parts of the plant or even to other plants that you had not intended to spray. 
Um, and if that spray, that in pesticide gets on the pollen or in the nectar of the flower, when the pollinators come and ingest that, they are also going to be ingesting that pesticide. So it can be very harmful to our pollinators. So those are just some of the things that you might do to help our pollinators. So I mentioned that you, know, you want to try to plant things that uh, attract more than one type of pollinator. So how do you know what that is? Basically, the pollinators are attracted to different colors of flowers. So you want to think about that. Now, bees like flowers that are bright white, yellow, or blue. And I see a lot of little tiny bees in the fall on my alyssum. They just love it. Uh, and butterflies, now butterflies like bright flowers that are red or purple or orange. And right now, I'm seeing quite a few butterflies around my lantana, my butterfly bush, and, and my butterfly weed. Of course, that is a host plant for our butterflies, so uh, that is a good plant to have as well. Now, hummingbirds like uh, flowers that have these funnel-like cups, and they come in, in red, orange, or even white. And a great example of that would be the coral honeysuckle. And as you're going into the main part of the arboretum, you'll see that coral honeysuckle on that trellis as you go through into the main part of the arboretum. Now, um, flies like pale and dull to dark purple flowers that are shallow. And an example of that would be lavender. Now, I mentioned that bats can even act as, as pollinators. And you're kind of thinking, well, what can they do? They come out at night. Well, actually, they are going to pollinate those plants that don't open in the bright sunlight, the ones that wait until you know, toward the end of the day when most of the pollinators have gone to roost. Uh, and those plants tend to be uh, white, green, or purple. And an example of that would be moonflower. So there are a lot of different things that you can do to attract the pollinators to your garden and to help our pollinators. And we have a lot of those plants to share and show you here in the Arboretum. So I am going to turn it over to Chris so that she can point out some of these things that you might want to consider for your garden. Chris? When you're planting your garden, if you're doing it to help the pollinators, try to think of the different seasons. For the spring, early spring, adding annuals to your um, uh, garden encourages the, the uh, pollinators to come looking, all right? They're gonna come looking and say, hey, we'll come back here and take a better look. During the summer, you have your perennials that are flowering. During the fall, you have other plants. Aster is another good one to add because it's a, a fall bloomer. And the uh, bees and wasps and beetles and flies love them, even the butterflies. What we have here in our demonstration garden is our annual. You'll see a lot of uh, uh, insects flying around there. And all those bright colors kind of encourage them and attract them to the area. Lantana, as Lois said, they love lantana. It does offer a lot of pollen and nectar for the uh, uh, insects and the hummingbirds. Uh, I wish all these were flowering, but they're not. Cardinal flower, hummingbirds love it. It's one that attracts them, but it's also good for butterflies and bees. Uh, you have your cone flowers. Coneflowers are not only good for our bees and butterflies, but if you leave them go, the seeds are great for birds during the winter. And that's why if you do have perennials, if you don't mind a little messy garden in the fall, let your perennials go to seed. The birds that are local birds here will eat the seeds, all right? And that provides them with nutrients. Uh, you have... The, uh, you can walk around the area after we finish the presentation because 
it's all hot. It's really hot out here. Uh, I will also encourage you to go into the butterfly garden. Ruth, how many did you count? We had about four caterpillars and about four chrysalis. Did you hear that? Four caterpillars and four chrysalis. <laughs> so uh, there, and we have two caterpillars, monarch caterpillars over here on the fennel, uh, and they're doing well. And uh, uh, so Lois already mentioned coral honeysuckle, which is a great plant. It's a vine. It does well um, in full to partial sun. And not only do the butterflies like it, but the hummingbirds like it also. It's the perfect shape for them. Joe pieweed. We don't have any here. It's over in the arboretum around the turtle, uh, the frog pond, which is behind the bomb center. Uh, the reason it's there is because it likes moist soil. And this doesn't stay moist very long. As you can see, it gets pretty bright and sunny here, very dry. But boy, does it attract. It is a late bloomer also, which is a good fall plant for uh, the pollinators. And it just attracts the butterflies and the, po and the bees and the uh, wasps um, and the flies. My grandson's deathly afraid of bugs, any kind of bug. Anything that flies past me is deathly afraid. And I keep telling him, the bugs are not interested in you. They're interested in the plant. You leave them alone, they're not going to bother you. So when you see bees and whatever, and if you have to get in there, but just don't bother them. They're not going to uh, swarm and bother you. Um, let's see, we're talking about Joe Pye weed. Oh, sage. If you can plant any plant, any type of sage is great for pollinators. It really attracts them because there's purple, purple there's uh, white, there's pink, there's red. Just comes in all different colors. Uh, Stokes Aster back here. It's finished blooming. That's one that should have bloomed a little later this summer, but it's a great pollinator plant. Of course, it likes sun, uh, so it's a great plant. Um, oh, there's one back here, right at the corner, that I just discovered maybe about two years ago. It's called Rattlesnake Master. So I have some in uh, my yard and I've had butterflies and uh, bees and everything all over them. I can't get close. You know, it's just great. So that's a, a kind of new plant. Do they sell it around here yet? No, I haven't seen it. I picked mine up online. So, uh, but it loves full sun and it loves our sandy soil. It does well. It's a pretty drought tolerant plant too. Um, talk well the goldenrod huh. I have goldenrod uh, all kinds about the full size which is fine but you know when goldenrod gets tall it falls over and the blooms hit the ground well then I said aha I'm gonna buy the dwarf goldenrod right hey <laughs> it didn't work the first year I let it go oh it's dwarf it's not gonna grow that tall Oh, it grew, it grew. It was like six feet tall. Of course, it was in front of the garden bed, so it blocked everything else out. Well, I let it flower, and of course, the uh, flower heads fell over and hit the ground. This year, I was smart. But uh, end of June, mid-July, I cut it back to about six, eight inches. Oh, it's doing beautifully. It's just the perfect height. It is dwarf now. <laughs> and it looks great. And it's going to bloom nicely. And because it's a little smaller, it's also more compact. So the blooms aren't going to fall over. Um, so whenever they talk about dwarf plants, make sure you really do your research and read about whether or not you have to cut them back. Because that's something that is important. Uh, don't forget your herbs, okay? Intersperse them in around your plants. They, as they get older, they bloom and the insects are really, really attracted to them. And they're a great one to intersperse into your garden. 
Uh, grasses. They don't flower. Now, nah, they get seed heads on them. So why would you plant grasses in your garden? The insects and the pollinators use them as cover. A lot of moths and skippers lay their eggs in these grasses, such as muley grass and blue stem. And uh, yeah, well, that's what we have here. So it's a great protection and cover for them. Not only that, but of course the grasses, the seed heads feed the birds over the winter. Uh, so don't forget your grasses in your uh, landscape if you're planning on a pollinator garden because they use it uh, uh, for cover, for protection during bad weather. And also the moth, there are some moths and butterflies that will lay their eggs in there and uh, they will eat it, you know, become caterpillar forms and eat it. Um, trying to think. There's another one that we don't have here, and I don't think we have it in the Arboretum. It's called the Swamp Sunflower, um, also known as Narrow Leaf Sunflower. Do you have it in the butterfly? That is one that will flower uh, probably in September, October. The bad thing with that one, oh, just like goldenrod, I learned, nah, 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 Ruth, you cut it back, you cut it back. The swamp goldflower can get six to eight feet tall, all right? And it can, it's kind of scraggly and everything like that. All right, well, one year I had a dog that um, planted them, and for some reason he liked them. I had all these other swamp flowers that were growing tall and everything. These never got very tall. Well, then we found out he was eating them. Ah, <laughs> uh, so, well, then we stopped him from eating But they bloomed nicely, uh, and they were short. So that's another one. If come July, you start cutting it back, trimming it back to about eight inches, six inches, and, and just then leave it go, it will bloom and be a more manageable height. The one thing about those narrow leaf sunflowers is they do spread, all right? It's, they're a little aggressive. They're not invasive, you can control them, but they do spread and it's easy to pull out. Once it rains, if it ever rains again here, who knows? Uh, all right, uh, you know, all the daisies, the Shasta daisy, the black-eyed Susans, they are great for pollinators, uh, all the herbs, the ground covers. <sighs> Diversify. It does not have to be a native, but it may be something that you really like that has an attractive color to it. It will attract the pollinators. Will it feed them? No, but it may provide some nutrients because there's so much research going on about the um, non-native plants. Do they provide uh, nutrients for our insects and for our birds? They're still doing a lot of research on it. And uh, they're finding that it does provide some, so it will attract them. Um, oh, don't forget your bulbs too. Those are early, usually spring um, and summer that will attract them. And that's the beginning of the season. And your weeds. Don't pull out all your weeds. Some of the weeds are early bloomers, all right? And these weeds, before some of our annuals and some of our perennials uh, start blooming, they provide the first nutrients to a lot of our pollinators. Well, thank you for coming.